Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, nothing makes me happier when shit just works. That is fantastic. So yeah, just, just to clear up some of that stuff, congratulations on being here on Friday. The place really starts to fill up on Saturday, because I guess some people think going to two-thirds of a conference is a good idea. Um, it's a morning crowd. People are both excited, and they have not yet been disappointed. Life is still open and new. Some people are barely able to hear me because there's some sort of hangover buzz. Some have discovered the power of bourbon last night. I know how that all works. Anyway, so. Um, okay. We have. If you could make sure that it is actually on me and I am there and stuff, that's all. Okay, I'm. Shit's just working. This year's theme is unity. Next year's theme is the shit just works. God, that's fantastic. Okay, well, okay. So this is my crowd. All right. You're in the wrong room over there. We've got things beyond belief. Drones on. All right. Anyone who comes in now, you know that they're a dilettante. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to DerbyCon. My name is Jason Scott. I am a happy speaker at DerbyCon. I have been to all of the DerbyCons. Still my favorite conference just for people doing what a conference is meant to do. Um, the name of this talk is And You Shall Know Me by My Trail of Manuals, and it is the uh, description of a project I involved myself in about a, a month and a half ago, where that project went, and abject lessons that have come that may be of use to your life, but probably not. Um, a story from a little bit earlier yesterday was that I was on a plane coming here, and that's when I realized I had left my laptop on the TSA belt, which is the worst time to notice that, by the way, <laughs> because not only have I noticed it, but I know that the plane doesn't have Wi-Fi, and I know that it's going to be a couple hours before the plane lands, so I get to sit there. And I was reading a book on the history of bomb-making manuals, <laughs> and... It was harder to concentrate on this book. It's called The Wrong Hands, A History of, of Bomb-Making Manuals. And um, I, I realized then that I felt the same helplessness that drives a lot of the work I do. And that sense of something that I owned, something that was mine, data I kept on there, that, that, that cold-blooded calculation of coming into your inventory of what you have, is is what I fight against every single day. As it turned out, I landed, and that's when I determined that I hadn't done that. It was a happy ending. And like Fight Club, the, the breakfast was the finest breakfast I had ever tasted. It was that, that sense that my porn wasn't in the hands of a, a low-paying worker <laughs> who knew that this was his big shot and, and, and screw that boss of his. So it was just a great day. And so today is a great day. And, and, and so I decided I'd dress conservatively and just give people the story that they needed. Anyway, so what I do during the day and the night and the weekends is I work for a place called the Internet Archive, archive.org, also known as the Wayback Machine, also now known as the Internet Arcade. Um, and it's a collection of old web pages, old data, um, software, movies, music uh, that has been both provided to us and acquired by us. Uh, it's a, coming up on 20 years next year. Um, it was founded by a millionaire named Brewster Kale who decided to do something decent with his millions. And in a fit of the kind of visionary weirdness, he hired me about four years ago. And I have continued to work there, and I adore it. Um, this is a midnight tour that I give at the archive, and people like to listen to me. So we, uh, I dress up in dark clothing, and at midnight they have to walk through our building with flashlights. And the fact that I was able to propose this on a Tuesday 
and have this happen on a Friday is the kind of nimble company I really enjoy working for. Um, in my life, though, this caused a reputation, which is Jason likes old things, um, which I do. I do like old things. Um, so when I start to talk about my life and I talk about the things here, I'm going to be a little different than other presentations. Fuck words, okay? Fuck having words on the screen that you are forced to read while the person talks to you over here. I'm going to have no words after this except for the information on what this talk was. This is all pictures going on in. Listen to me, look over there, or be weird, do the opposite. <laughs> but if you're out there and you're giving a speech, please let me, let me tell you, the reason people remember my speeches and come back to them is because sometimes instead of sitting down and wondering about, did I get this exact layout of this frame exactly right with all of this information, I instead said, what will people enjoy? What will in treat them to something neat? And what will inspire them to move forward? So remember that when you're working on your presentation, fuck words. Same thing for words when they are in the replacement of actions. <laughs> when, it's, when it's you saying, this is what should have happened, then you are in the wrong position. You, you, you got to put your hands back into the Cheetos bag, away from the keyboard, and think about why you're telling other people what they should do instead of doing it yourself. This is about action. I love old things of all kinds. Uh, these are old telephone repair tools at a museum. I love old things that just speak to a certain time. For some people, they're new. To some people, they're old. Uh, it, 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 it asks people to ask questions. What, 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 why are some people in this room happy? What, what, what is this thing? What, what's going on here? Uh, I was very disappointed because the new versions of this let you click in the piece. And I'm like, if, you're, if your finger doesn't have the red welt of damage, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the red welt of discovery. This is the prototype of the Amiga um, split up into its in components, uh, wire wrapped. And it was just sitting on a table at an event. So I went up to it and I touched it. And each one of those piles of, 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 uh, of boards ended up being one chip. The Angus, the Paula. You know, one does just sound, one does video. And the fact is, is by keeping this kind of history around, I mean, you might find something in there that will innovate something in the future, but it's less about that than recognizing that these are the parts from which we came. These are the things that make us us. These are the things that inspired the people that made us us. Um, and so when I called for the world to send me all of their AOL CDs, and this is the beginning of that pile, there was a lot of, why would you do that? And it was because it was 50% of all manufactured CD-ROMs during the late 1990s. It's a part of our history. It's a part of what makes us us. And there were so many variations because people got so sick of them that there's incredible artwork within the AOL CDs. So I've been collecting hundreds and hundreds of AOL CDs. Do I like AOL? No! AOL was shit! But I wanted that history more than I needed to have a personal opinion. Conversely, there's an idea of a manual. In one world, a manual is not particularly interesting if you don't have the thing that the thing is a manual for. And if you have the thing and you need the manual, the manual is the most important thing in the world. But if you don't have that manual, um, um, you're not just missing out on the instructions on how something was built. You're missing out on an entire culture of how the manual was made, the methods by which that manual was manufactured, the, the writing style, the, the graphic style. You know, there's lots of other encoded cultural information in manuals. I recognize this, and we've had hundreds of arcade game manuals, blender manuals, mixer manuals, manuals that came and told you about how to use this particular printer or this particular gun. And it, all of it is, again, meaningful in its own way. And so I liked manuals. I mean, I didn't go to sleep with one, but I did like them. 
you know, none under the pillow, any of that stuff. So I got this call from a place um, that was called Manuals Plus. And Manuals Plus is located in Maryland, and I lived in New York. And Manuals Plus said, yeah, people told us to talk to you because we're going to go out of business this year. And we have all these manuals, and maybe you can help us find a home for some of them. And I said, that would be very interesting. How many manuals do you have? And she's like, hundreds of thousands. <laughs> I did not run. I did not cower. I said, OK. Because many times else, I have people contact me and say, you know, these manuals, these piles of disks, these, what, it's huge. And I go, OK, how, how big is it? How many carloads does it fit in? And it will be one carload. But to them, it was huge. Uh, I took a delivery of 3,000 floppy disks, but it was only, you know, one carload. Not devastatingly huge. And sometimes people's numbers are weird. 200,000 sounded pretty high. I thought this person was being a little bit facetious. Her name was, was Becky. Um, but, okay, so, so uh, she didn't get back to me <laughs> for months. And that's fine. I mean, people get back to me, you know, whenever. I guess they're either out of business or whatever. But then she called me in June and said, I think it's coming soon. And it had been six months. And I was like, okay, Becky, good to see you again. Still 200,000 manuals? Yep, still 200,000 manuals. Okay. Manuals can be bulky. Manuals can be small. But people need manuals. And it turned out that this was a building full of manuals. Um, she called me on a Wednesday and said, yeah, he's throwing everything out next week. I was like, OK, thank you for the warning, Becky. Um, and she put me on the phone with him. And I got a sense right then and there I needed to go down there. Because when I said to him, yeah, I could see about moving some of these manuals to a safe location and figure out what to do next, the skepticism in his voice could be used as a spare tire. It was really unbelievably strong. And I got a sense from him, this guy appreciated action. So that Friday, I drove down to Manuals Plus in their Finksburg, Maryland warehouse to speak to Nick because I knew showing up was 99% of the battle here. And I walked in, and this is what I saw. So it turns out she wasn't lying. <laughs> Um, she's, she's not lying at all, Becky. Uh, there's actually a lot of manuals in this room. I appreciate that. And again, this was a Friday. And I said, you know, okay, all right. Are there doubles? Yes, yes, there's doubles. We think there's a lot of doubles. And you know, we think maybe, you know, some of the, we think there's only like 20 or 30,000 uniques in this C. Um, okay. And, and, and the thing is, I've learned just not to be, not to be a barrier. You say, okay, you work it out later. You say, okay, all right, I understand. Nothing's bothering me here. Uh, as a person who likes hats, I've walked into hat stores and said, how much is this hat? And they'll say $600. And I can say, oh, that's very nice. And inside is the little part of my brain going, what? <laughs> can I live in it? Does it have free heat? So being able to keep that part of my voice that was like, oh, no, this is not was, was, was extremely helpful. And so I'm walking through these with Nick, and Nick's telling me, oh, yeah, you know, this was acquired from another company. He had bought it about five years earlier. They sold manuals on eBay. They sold copies through their site. Um, and he had figured the business would stick around for a certain number of years before electronic scanning and other things killed it. So he had kind of kept it going, but the numbers had been going down. And then finally, they were moving to a new building because the lease had become too expensive on this building. And he has other businesses. And uh, so he was like, I don't want to spend the money to do the environmental controls in the new building. It's just not worth it to like spend a few hundred grand to get like the rooms up to speed. And so yeah, we're getting out of this. And I was like, OK, all right, Nick, you know, OK, that's, that's cool, man. And I, I was like, OK, so it's Friday. I'm like, we could probably get a pretty good 
pretty good amount of these out of the door in a week. And he was like, yeah, but we're going to throw everything out on Wednesday. I'm like, okay. All right. Again, notice, inside voice, outside voice. A lot of people don't think I have a, uh, an inside voice. But <laughs> it is. And here's the thing. This is the part that's shocking, right? Is that the inside voice is actually this scared little creep who's afraid of making risks and choices. And I squelched that little fucker like it was nothing. <laughs> but it's in there. We all have it. It's that little bit of fear of jumping into the void and wondering if there's anything to land on. And will it be soft? And will it try to sue me or kill me? And, and you don't know. So I said, okay, Wednesday it is. Um, so immediately I, I got on the horn with a friend who has a little bit of extra money. And I said, could you please just send 125 banker boxes to this location so that they're waiting on Monday? Like I knew I had to do that. There was no chance. And... Um, so that's what happened. Uh, he called up Uline and, and said, you know, 125 banker boxes and had them shipped for Monday. And okay, good. I drove home that night, having driven in this that morning. So that was that was a couple hundred miles each way. And I wrote this blog entry at two in the morning, saying, in real time, help me save these manuals. I need your assistance. I need your friendship. I need money if you, if you can't make it. And please, will people consider coming to this warehouse on Monday? Help me rescue these manuals. And, and that's the jumping into the void. Because I was just one schmuck. I, I was dressed better. But I was, I was just one schmuck. And so people saw what I saw, which is that these manuals are meaningful. These manuals are beautiful. They have a meaning beyond being thrown out. The, the fact that they were being thrown out was not a testimony to their value. It was purely a testimony to a business plan, which was fair. I mean, Nick was making a choice. And here he was saying to me, I'll give you everything you can carry out of my business, uh, which is an incredible amount of faith. And I said, yep, I hope to have an army of people here and we will work on this. And I wrote emphatic messages. And I got thousands of dollars in the mail, or the PayPal, as we call it now. And I ended up having the money to make choices, and I had people saying, where do I got to go? Where do I got to go? Um, people showed up in droves. And the, the first ones were there when I got there at 8.30 in the morning. And they started to walk in, and they sat down. And what we said was, look at the manuals. Try, if we can, to get one of each. Try not to get too many of the same. You're going to screw up. You know, a speech started to be delivered from people. Um, and again, these are people just walking in and off the street. Some were professional librarians. Many, many, many were just geeks, uh, followers of mine, friends of mine, showing up. And, I, and, and we, we built a speech around it. We said, okay, first take a walk around pull in this, this fortress of manual solitude, and then we're going to put you onto a shelf. And you're going to go through this shelf and try to take out every unique item. And you're going to screw up. We're going to lose manuals. We're going to have manuals get destroyed in the process. We're going we're gonna to get too many of one because of some reason. That is called entropy. That is part of the life. You can't not do the project because it's not going to be perfect. And you, personally, are going to screw up. And don't worry about it. Every person who came in got this speech. Every person was empowered with the sense that they were doing the best job they could, that they were better than a void, and that they were going to make things better. Um, boxes turned out to be one of the hardest things to do because they had to be assembled. So they were assembling up uh, these banker boxes for us to put in. And um, we quickly realized that we had not bought enough banker boxes. Uh, we had really, really, really not bought enough banker boxes. <laughs> we, were, we, were, we, were, we were shitting ourselves. We were running up Mount Everest with a Q-tip and the theme song to Cheers. That was the entire way we had prepared. So I called Uline imbued with the thousands of dollars people had given me and said, hi, it's 11 a.m. How soon today can I get 1,500 more banker boxes? 
So it turns out that through phone calls and through talking to their credit department and through the, the generous work, I'm just going to go right back to uh, Ephraim just because he's around, but this Ephraim who used his credit card to, 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 uh, to make the payment, um, it turns out that's three hours uh, and uh, $4,000. Of which $500 is the fuck you plan better next time fee. <laughs> um, so, so three hours later, we, we got, you know, while people are sitting here putting up boxes in the back, we got piles and piles of pallets of boxes. And luckily, since this place had used to be a, a warehouse, we were able to put in all of these, uh, these, these, boxes into, uh, uh, you know, pallets and move them in, drop them down, have people work on them. And so we ended up with 1,600 banker boxes, which is a lot. And these are just volunteers walking in. I, I, th I think that kid on the left is actually younger than all of the manuals. And, <laughs> and the youngest person who helped us was nine, by the way. So, I mean, he was, he was younger than my, my memories of shows I had watched. So, he, he, you know, there were people who came in who were just with families, like entire families showed up. It hit Reddit and it hit Slashdot. And you'd go, what? And yes, like ancient gods rising from the tar of, of madness, Slashdot people showed up. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you still read Slashdot? And, and oh my god, you, you got up. And, 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 and here they were. So yeah, like lots of stock stop people showed up. Um, and we started to pack up boxes. We started to pack up a lot of boxes. We packed up boxes until we couldn't see straight. We ended up with piles and piles of boxes. Boxes beyond all imagining. This was over the course of two days. Um, 70 people showed up. Uh, one guy showed up. He got a lift from somebody and he had no plan on how to get home. He got a one-way ride with somebody, didn't even know where this was, and went there. Uh, we found him a hotel. And what we did was we, we had, to, everything was being, and here's the thing, everything was being improvised, right? When your plan starts on a Friday and you're working on Monday, all plans are improvised. So first problem was, well, how do you demarcate somebody has gone through a shelf? So we started to put painter tape over one shelf of a unit and said, that unit is done. And we uh, packed up boxes so that things were heavier and lighter. We ended up having two people whose job was to actually open up a box, um, go through the box, and then find um, things that could be repacked stronger and thicker into other boxes so that there were not lost boxes with one manual because somebody was like, it's protected and being done. <laughs> So people invented jobs on the fly. Given enough agency, they invented tasks on the fly. They improved the, 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 the flabby, dough-like volunteers that wandered in on Monday were hardened obsidian by Tuesday. The reason we're the apex predator is because we really, really, really adapt quickly. First day you kill one of us, next day four of us are killing you. <laughs> Ten days later, we have a factory of robots that kill you. <laughs> Twenty days later, we're writing think pieces about the robots and the original predator that's now gone. That's what we do. We adapt quickly. And we ended up, like I said, with, oh, did I say 1,600? It was actually more like 1,700. We ended up raiding local staples and Costco's to end up with more. Now, here's an important thing. I had been using amateur labor up to this point to great benefit. People who did not get paid, people who we ordered pizza for and who were given water and other sustenance to be able to do their work. But these were people who were just volunteering their time. And there reached a point at which people were not needed who um, had no dog in the fight, didn't even have a dog. They just wanted to be helpful. And I thought the worst way to hurt these people would be to make them now lift these boxes anywhere. And so we did, in fact, hire pros, uh, again, with a 24-hour notice, 
But that's what pros are for. It's more expensive that way, but we hired them. And these dudes came in, and their job was to load it up into a truck and go to three storage units I was able to get one mile away. Um, and and they were up for it, right? Because to them, it was just a job. Take all these boxes, put them in a box, drive the box to another box, put the boxes in the box. <laughs> Which is how they described it. Like, it's kind of funny to watch... A bunch of a bunch of movers like slowly mentally deal with the uh, uh, kind of job you wouldn't have gotten when you were in prison, much less <laughs> in other places. And the guy was like, "I ain't going home. There's a box there. Oh yeah, I'm not going to any of those stores. They're in boxes. I'm telling my wife to move my lunch into some sort of bag. I don't want a box." And so I'm just listening to them work on it. So here, here are the four. I always, you know, I, I got all their names. They're listed. And, and I just, you know, um, and on the far, far uh, right on your side uh, with the hat, that was his birthday. So I tipped him hard. I tipped them all hard because it was just like, hi, no warning, 1,600 boxes. And they loaded them into uh, storage units that were what the closest thing I could find. Uh, again, just like checking on Monday, what storage units are there. And we ended up with piles and piles and piles of boxes inside of a storage unit. And that, you know, should be, to some extent, the end of the story, right? Just, hooray! Manuals were saved. Um, when we were done, we had left behind us these shelves that were now not fully devoid, but, you know, the uniques had gone away. We think their number, she originally said, 21,000 people, uh, sorry, 21,000 manuals, and I think it's more like 50 to 75,000. Like, we just ran the numbers, like, just kind of looking at them. We were like, this is 50 to 75,000 manuals uh, of stuff that is now in a storage unit in Maryland uh, instead of here. Um, the manuals uh, that were left behind, all of these are manuals that we didn't get. Um, I ended up going through one more round and picking up a bunch of pretty manuals to mail to people who had sent me money as a thank you. Because that's the two hardest words after fuck you are thank you. And, and uh, I, I, I wanted to thank people. Like if it's not obvious, this is just this huge humanistic, you know, soul combination. It's a bunch of people wishing something to come true, and it just became true. Not on the power of money, not on the power of I pressed the right button, but because they believed in what I believed in, which was this isn't the way this should end, with just a room destroyed. Was it pretty? No. Was it nice? No. Um, I left a bunch of flowers for Becky to thank her, and I left a bottle of scotch for uh, Nick to thank him for giving it away. And, and that should have been, hooray! So that's the story of where it ended at one point, and I suppose I could walk away and get applause, and yeah, look at me, I kick some ass. But stories are never completely done. A few days later, somebody said, this was really special what you did. Um, you should consider organizing this to happen again in the future. So he registered for me <laughs> archivecore.com, archivecore.net, archivecore.org. And it's up, A-R-C-H-I-V-E-C-O-R-P-S dot org. And I put up a mailing list that said, do you want to know about these when they happen again? 700 people signed up within a week. 30% of them are professionals in the archiving or librarian sciences. So, suddenly I have an army <laughs> ready to go at a moment's notice. Um, I came back a few weeks later, and here's the thing. Again, you have people whose hands slowly come out of the snack bag and come to the keyboard and provide their wisdom. And people explained to me that this was awful. Everything was, every single thing we had done was awful. Uh, there were professionals that considered me awful. There were other people who considered me awful, or the project awful, or the process awful. 
And they had all sorts of reasons for it being awful. Um, one fundamental one, which I liked, which I actually bought into, was it was kind of, it's bad to leave these boxes in a storage unit on direct concrete for any period of time. Concrete wicks up moisture, and you were looking at this, you know, you were basically going to use the first layer of these boxes as a kind of moisture pad for the rest of it. So we made sure that we got pallets and replaced them all up on pallets, and in doing so labeled generally what was in each box. And so that process is ongoing. So maintenance continues to be an issue. Um, I've been in the process of building those things up. I've been in contact with museums. Um, I work for the Internet Archive. We scan things, so we're going to scan a lot of things. Um, I have now, now that I am unintentionally one of the largest, most non-profitable manual businesses in the United States. <laughs> I was informed by a collector who does this sort of thing a lot, something I didn't even think of, which was, please step carefully in what you say, because you will destroy this market. You know, Manuals Plus chose to get out just simply because of a building. But there are other people who are maintaining these barely scraping by paper manual businesses. And if I come out with like, manuals are free now, some of them may just dumpster them quietly and just say, well, I guess I'm out of that business. So step carefully, which is not advice people usually give me or that I listen to. So we're, the HP manuals world is different than the Tektronix manuals world, which is different than the other you know, historic manuals world. And I'm learning that. And I'm trying to put online things that have no commercial value initially. A world will eventually, I believe, exist where all of these manuals are online, because that's where I come from. And so becoming a part of a thing unintentionally, remember, I went from Wednesday to, this would be neat, to Wednesday, I have everything. Now what? Um, it's the old joke about, you know, buying um, box sets. It's like, I've never really heard the Allman Brothers. I think I'll listen to all of the Allman Brothers. And that's what it is now. I've gotten manuals from places from the 40s, manuals from companies I've never heard of, Fluke Electronics. I mean, I have to point out, I don't know any of these. Somebody told me the, 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 uh, the motto for Fluke Electronics, which was, if it works, it's a fluke. <laughs> I'm sure that was being told to people in 1968, but I just heard it. It's funny. It holds up. Um, so, so we've got weird little places that are going on, and so this process is ongoing. I did not get my hands on an old car. I acquired a puppy, and the puppy's going to grow, and the puppy's going to have needs, and I'm going to have to pay attention. So there's a responsibility that comes with this. Um, and like I said, that's where I started to run into interesting arguments about like, well, you did it wrong. And they're right, by the way. Let's, let's be straight up, straight up here. With my powerful hindsight time machine, I realized I should have used Gaylords, which are a uh, style of large bin storage that go on pallets. We should have palleted in Gaylords, stacked things into the Gaylords, forklifted them into a truck and taken them away. Probably would have done it in half the time. Probably would have been much more aggressive, probably would have been much more effective and given us more leeway. Didn't know that. Didn't know that. Next time will be better. Um, discussed from some archivists about um, uh, manuals being placed on the floor before they were being placed into the boxes. Uh, and, and an overriding hatred, and I must say again, this is a small sliver of professional archivists, but it hit me because I was really hurt. And I don't mean by them, because that doesn't work. I just meant in terms of I had really, really, really damaged my back. And I'm still hurt in my back. I really should see a doctor about this. But I was sitting there with my hurt back, and my car had blown up. So, you know, the axle came loose and shot through the transmission, which turns out to be expensive to fix. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, surely this number can't be up, oh, new car. So I have a new car now that I am leasing because my old car died for this. Um, so, 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 um, but they had ideas about it. And one of them was a disgust that amateurs were being used, that I was utilizing and, and exploiting an army of volunteers. 
and, and, and to, to do this process. And it would have been better. Only one person went this far. But it always is that one person you remember, isn't it? It would have been better for it all to have been gone than for it to have been just done by a bunch of amateurs with no clear plan. And I, I was initially really bothered because I was really in pain. So I let it get to me. And then I realized this is exactly what happened with open source software. There was that period right after 95, 97, if you were there, where all the engineers who had spent 20 years working on a network driver that would never go down, went, why the fuck is everyone applauding this 14-year-old idiot who made a driver that sucks? And it was because I've got every single certification. I did everything I was supposed to. I followed all the rules. And they're, they're hoisting this bastard up like he's a hero. Well, two reasons. Number one, when you can't pay people, Accolade and, 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 and emotion and expression of joy and support are the payment. That's one of the secrets of open source. And the other one was, not everything you were doing made sense and could be done by amateurs. And then there were parts that couldn't be done by amateurs. Consulting, staring somebody down in the face who is saying something beyond belief stupid, just light speed stupid and being like, hmm, yeah, 55 an hour. And all of these other skills went up. You were, you were fired from a job you thought you would have forever and you got either a better job or you weren't doing a job that an amateur couldn't do. And the archive groups are now realizing this. Like if I had said, <laughs> if I had said basically, hey, we're doing tracheotomies uh, Monday. <laughs> so if you could come to this warehouse in Finksburg, I got about 30 people. Uh, they got like apnea, really. So if you can just kind of come over, it's going to like root around in there and just kind of fix that apnea. Who's in? Well, you know, some subreddits would be up for it. But the others <laughs> would be, be just angry. Like, you can't do that. We have doctors. There's, there's procedures. We learned that. And archivists don't have that yet. Uh, as somebody who's a, uh, calls himself an archivist and works in that community, and right now, right now, they are cutting out this part of the talk in Mewtwo, and they are angrily sending it to each other. <laughs> and uh, freeze frame this, because <laughs> the fact that people off the street are perceived as good as you are is your fault. That is your fault. What I know, after I dug through the piles of horseshit and took out the few corn golden nuggets of wisdom from this, was that what was important was the stuff, and that we could make other decisions later, maybe even to get rid of it all. But I do know that when I went back uh, to this place, that's the sweat I generated moving these bags and boxes. And I walked back, and this is what's left. Uh, why? And let me please address this right now. I've mentioned Becky a lot. Why isn't Becky in there? That's because Becky got death threats from customers. So I'm not going to put Becky's picture into a, into a thing. Becky can choose to put her pictures up. Uh, she had people who thought this was all a conspiracy theory, that, that Nick was trying to destroy everything on purpose, for reasons I don't quite get. Ha ha ha! No one can operate oscilloscopes! Doesn't really strike me as a... <laughs> long-range plan for evil. I don't know. So, you know, left in a dearth of information, people dreamed up their own answers. And, and what I know was when I walked through this, the final pieces of, of this place, I knew what we had done made meaning, right? I knew that we were looking at shelves that used to hold all of this human knowledge that were now gone. They were gone. They were dumpstered. Everything we didn't take was gone. And if we had not moved if I had not broken my back, if I had not moved other people to take that leap, and they took that leap, and they took other people with them to bring that leap in, this would have been everything. I knew we made the right choice. And in your life, right, it's not always going to be easily known what's going on. Like, there's a problem, and there's a good show on. But the thing is, Netflix can be paused, and uh, YouTube videos can be paused, but life can't be paused. So you'll see a project that 
you will be told is just for two hours, but they really need you, and it ends up being eight hours, you weren't taking it advantage of. That means they needed you even more than they thought. And that's the kind of thing that I want to see from people, right? I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm rapidly not becoming a hacker in the general sense of being some sort of, you know, tinkering chrysalis waiting to bloom into an infosec butterfly. That's not really my path. My path is understanding that in among this technical knowledge here, there is so much knowledge to be gained about people and what we do and how we make our lives better and, and, and what makes us cry and what makes us happy and, and, and what of our families and, and what, what of the families that aren't here and the people who care about us. That's the stuff that I really, 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 really care about more than this exploit or somebody made a plane go sideways or whatever the hell. You know, at the end of the day, I ended up with this, I, I walked into a situation that I thought was like, oh, there's some manuals. And a week later, I had this. I had three of this, by the way. And that was the difference that one week made in my life uh, of doing this, right? Um, these, again, these manuals are being scanned. Some of them are already online. I'm going to have them scanned professionally by the archive and work through them that way. Um, we're going to try to go for the rare ones first. Uh, I've got negotiations in with homes. There's just endless amounts of phone calls and work ahead. Maybe more work than was done that day, but it's work that I'm really going to enjoy to do. Uh, a week later, Archive Core got a call from the industrial workers of the world, the IWW, the Wobblies. And they said, hey, we heard about Archive Core. And uh, we've got some file cabinets full of old IWW stuff, and we've tried to get some pro places to do it, but they're barely hanging on with the keeping it, and they don't really have time to scan it. We really want to put it online, and there are some of these old books that we have about ourselves, and we would love for them to go online. Just, you know, stuff going back to like 1905 that we have in our offices. Every once in a while, the Wobblies get firebombed, so we'd really kind of like to move on this at some point. <laughs> and I was like, we'll be right there. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I will take one hastily shouted question over the crowd of people bolting out to get to the next talk. I can't even see anybody here, so boldness is encouraged. Wow. This has been a fantastic oil painting. I am really proud to have been with you. I will be here all week. I'm not flying out or doing anything. I'm happy to talk about the Internet Archive. I'm happy to talk about the projects we do here. If you've got a whole bunch of manuals, maybe hold off, because I may punch you. But if there's a whole bunch of other stuff, happy to talk with you about it. And, and it's been a pleasure to see everyone. And now you know why people go to my talks. Thank you.